Good morning. Happy Sabbath, church family. It's great to be with you guys again after it's been a few months, right? It's been a few months hiatus, right? Since, uh, thank God your pastor uh, still trusts me. And uh, we know that no one is really worthy to be up here. There's only one that's worthy, and that's the Holy Spirit. He's the only one that's worthy to uh, share his word. But praise God for his grace and mercy that he has chosen mortals to be part of in this plan of salvation, to proclaim the gospel to an entire world. So, uh, brothers and sisters, have you ever asked yourself the question, Lord, why is this happening to me? Have you ever asked yourself, Lord, why didn't you answer the, your, my prayers as I thought best? Lord, why is it that you allowed this tragedy to happen in my life? Have you ever questioned God's love for you? Well, if you have, if you've ever had those questions as I have, have you ever struggled? Then this message is for you as it is for me this morning. Uh, brothers and sisters, when I speak, uh, when anyone speaks on God's character, we're standing on holy ground. And so I need his help, and I know you need his help this morning. And so I invite you to pray with me once again. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, in this moment, your people have come before you, not only to open your word, but to open our hearts and minds. Uh, we know, Lord, that we're living in a world of sin, of suffering around us, but we know that beams of light and mercy are constantly falling upon us. And we know in this season of tradition where we think about your first coming, Lord, we want to also remember something even deeper than just the coming, but rather it was the greatest revelation of your character to mankind. And Lord, this morning I pray for my brothers and sisters, Lord, that whatever they're feeling in this moment, whatever they've struggled with during these past few weeks, Lord, that they may set this aside so that we can understand your love and character once again. And Lord, use me according to your will, cleanse my heart and mind, empty me of self, and use me according to your will. For all these things we ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. God's character on display. We know, we know it's a season. We just had a season of Thanksgiving by tradition here in this nation. And um, I wanted to challenge you today that when we thank God, let's not just thank him for the things that he gives us, but even deeper than that, Thank him for who he is. And that's what I want to study this morning. Um, the, your pastor, Bell, asked me to speak a little bit about his first coming. And I will touch on that subject a little bit. I know it's the season to think about that. And it's a great opportunity to share that. But I want to touch something even deeper this morning. And, I want, and as we look at God, uh, God's word of the scripture this morning, you will understand better. Brothers and sisters, how can I explain who God is and his character? I'm just a mortal. I'm a sinner saved by grace. I'm mortal. He's infinite. He's all-powerful, all-knowing. But praise God that his word tells us this in Deuteronomy 29, 29. This is a promise that he gives to me and to each of any, every one of you this morning. The secret things belong to who? The Lord, our God. But those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. What's the reason that he reveals himself? It's so that it says that we may do all the words of this law. In other words, brothers and sisters, it's true that there are things that in this life we might not get the answers of those deep questions. Even in this life, we will have to wait till we see him face to face. But he has revealed enough of his character so that we can still trust him, love him, and obey what he's asking us to do. Don't you say amen? Brothers and sisters, in the beginning, it was not so. This, what we see around us, the suffering of mankind, the separation between us, brothers and sisters, between God and his creatures, between his creation, that did not exist. Back in Genesis, the first chapters, it was perfect harmony between God and his creation. Man had the privilege of speaking with God as I'm speaking to you this morning. The holy pair had God, Christ himself, come and visit them in the garden and all was perfect in harmony, and they just had great joy just being in the presence of God. Brothers and sisters, but all of a sudden, something came into this world. It was something new. It was something that had started sometime before in heaven. It was started off in the heart of a being, and that it ended up turning into what we know as sin, the spirit of rebellion. And it wasn't enough that this creature, that this being thought that it was enough to begin this rebellion up in heaven, but he wanted to spread this rebellion all over the universe. And so he brought this down to earth. Unfortunately, the holy pair fell. They listened to the voice of this rebellious one, 
And we know the story, the sad story, and we can see it all the way until our days today. The consequences, brothers and sisters, the holy pair had to separate for a time from God's presence, but praise God that he made a way. Don't you say amen? amen? So that one day Eden can be restored, and not only the holy pair, but also Eden can be restored to all of their descendants as well. Brothers and sisters, but what started was a problem that had never been seen before on his, this earth, and this is the problem of sin. You know, anything that is happening in your life that is negative, that is sad, that is tragic, all of it in the end is the root cause of everything is because of sin. Anything that you could trace. And I'm going to share that with you through the word of God. Now, when sin entered this world, it brought about a sad dilemma. You guys know what the word dilemma is. It's a very tough problem where it doesn't have an easy solution. Have you ever been in a dilemma in your life where you had to make some tough choices? Choices that you didn't want to make, but you had to make them because that was the only way out of that dilemma. Brothers and sisters, interesting that the God, the king of this universe, mankind put God against the wall and, and caused a sad dilemma because of sin. These are the three questions that now the creator Throughout this whole scenery, throughout these events, what we call the great controversy, which is the conflict between good and evil, light and darkness, truth and error. Brothers and sisters, these are the three questions that unfortunately my sin and your sin places God each and every day. Three questions. How does a loving father deal with sin and the sinner at the same time? Have you ever asked yourself that question when you're dealing with someone that has sinned against you? How does a loving father do everything to save a child while respecting their free will? Probably mothers and fathers this morning probably understand this a little bit better than I do, that question. Number three, how does a loving father deal with rebellious children that want to destroy his other children? That is a dilemma. You know, brothers and sisters, I just had parent-teacher conferences just a couple of months ago, and I was meeting with one of the parents, and I was telling them about how great their child was doing in my class, and I noticed that, the, that this, uh, this mother and father were very quiet. They usually, I've spoken with them over the phone, and they're usually very talkative, but I noticed that the conference, the parent-teacher conference was very quiet. They let me do most of the speaking. And I said, is everything all right? And I said, your, your daughter's doing great in my class. Her reading level has gone up, uh, doing great in math, her behavior, all that. So we, and they said, no, it's not that, uh, Mr. Montoya. They said, can we speak to you for a moment? Now they know that I'm a person of faith, and they are as well. And so they said, I said, yeah, sure, we don't have, we have about 15 minutes till my next conference, and so I can give you a few minutes. And they started just opening up. I, I usually shudder a little bit when people want to share too much of their private lives because I respect their privacy, but I just let them speak. And they said, you know, um, you know we have an older son. And I said, yeah, yeah, I, I know. Um, he has, actually used to attend this school years ago. Uh, their son is about 16 years old, and they were telling me that... Uh, that week or the week before, they had to make one of the toughest decisions that a parent has ever had to make. And that decision is that they had to call the police on their own son. You know, the son uh, started becoming violent uh, with his siblings um, because of drugs. Uh, his behavior started completely changing, they were telling me. And what broke the straw on the camel's back is that one night, uh, the son decided to become violent with the mother. And he knocked her over in the kitchen, and of course, the father had no choice. This is a difficult dilemma. They said, we love our son, but for the sake and the safety and harmony of our home and for the protection of the younger ones and my own, we had to do one of the most difficult decisions. Brothers and sisters, this is the dilemma that your sin and my sin has brought about on the creator of the universe. How does he deal with that? How many of you are in the medical field? Maybe some studied biology or doctors, maybe a surgeon in the... When a surgeon has to do sometimes make difficult decisions, even with a patient, the patient is dealing with a cancer. The doctor has to make a decision, how do I remove this tumor, this cancer, without killing the victim, the patient? And that's the dilemma that God has. So let's look at this even deeper. Satan is constantly of work with intense energy and under a thousand disguises to misrepresent the character and government of God. With extensive, well-organized plans and marvelous power, he is working to hold the inhabitants of the world under his deceptions. 
<clears throat> the world, it says, the one infinite and all wise sees the end from the beginning, and in dealing with evil, his plans were, were far-reaching and comprehensive. In other words, brothers and sisters, because man is finite, because we do not, cannot see the future, because we cannot see the past, we many times put God against the wall and we decide that we can judge God and his character. And so the devil, and that is the same spirit of rebellion that started in heaven. Satan wanted to bring doubt upon not only he ended up doubting God's love and his character, and so now he wanted to infect the rest of the heavenly family as well with that spirit of doubt. It was his purpose not, not merely to put, to, it was his, talking about God, his purpose not merely to put down the rebellion, but to demonstrate to all the universe the nature of the rebellion. God's plan was unfolding, showing both two things, brothers and sisters, both his justice and his mercy, and fully vindicating his wisdom and righteousness in dealing with his evil. Brothers and sisters, we're going to understand something deeper. It has been Satan's purpose since the past, and he's doing it right now, even in our own lives, brothers and sisters, to take man to the extremes of understanding, misunderstanding God's character. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs, neither take my foot to the left nor to the right, but depart my foot from evil. And that is what we want to do, brothers and sisters. Let us never go to the extremes and always stand on the sure word of God. These are the two extremes that he's presented to the world. The same lie from the beginning, from Genesis, and it continues, and sadly today, even in the Christian world. You know, we've been studying the Sabbath school lesson, speaking a little bit about eternal hell and torment. These are the two extremes that we're seeing today. You could see it in even all false religions. First of all, there's a doctrine that's been going around for a long time. Maybe you've heard of it. It's just an extension of what we call cheap grace. Universalism or universal salvation is the belief that every person will go to heaven when they die. Another way, uh, another way people often express this idea is all roads lead to heaven. This belief is based on the principle that God is all love and therefore would not send anyone to hell. In other words, it sounds beautiful, brothers and sisters, but what it's saying is it doesn't matter what you do, what you say in this life, that in the end, God's love is so irresistible that he has to save everyone. Brothers and sisters, is this a biblical doctrine? You know, if that was true, then I'm wasting my time this morning because you could just leave these doors and continue your life the way it is. You don't have to have Christ. And in the end, everyone will enter those pearly gates. On the other extreme, this is Satan's doing. On the other extreme, to misrepresent his character before his children is the doctrine of eternal torment. In hell, it teaches that there's a literal place of fire where the devil, his angels, and the wicked men will burn rise alive and be tormented forever. In other words, while the saints enjoy peace and joy in heaven for eternity, unrepentant sinners will be kept alive to be tortured for all eternity. Some churches teach that this place exists now, and they teach that at the moment of death, the souls of the wicked men are sent to this place. Brothers and sisters, two extremes, and this is misrepresenting the character of God. Brothers and sisters, we have to understand something when it comes to the question of suffering. This has been the big debate. God's sovereign will versus man's free will. We need to understand something, brothers and sisters, and I've shared this before in a past message. There's an old saying that says life is like a restaurant. You can have whatever you want as long as you're willing to pay the price. In other words, when you go to a restaurant, maybe this evening after sunset and you take out your loved ones, the waiter's not going to come and tell you, no, you don't look like you can afford this. You can order everything on the menu, the drinks, the desserts. You can serve yourself two, three, four times. But before you leave those double doors, what do you have to do? You have to pay the bill. And this is what men sometimes don't understand, and this is the struggle, that Satan has misrepresented God's character before world, that men have thought that they are more intelligent than their creator. Look at this, um, one of the greatest... I, I'm not going to use, well, I guess I shouldn't use the word greatest, but one of the most infamous atheists of our day, 20th and 21st century, Richard Dawkins, he's still alive. Sadly, he travels the world, infecting this in college campuses all over the world. He doesn't call himself an atheist, he actually calls himself an anti-theist. In other words, he believes his mission is totally destroy the notion of a supernatural creator. And this is what he says. It's very sad that many times people try, read the word of God, they pick what they want, and if they only took the time to spend 
and getting to know God. But this is his conclusion, that when he reads the Bible, he says this, the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all of fiction, jealous and proud, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, vindicative, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticide, genocidal, filicidal, pestisential, megalomaniac, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. And you know, we might say, what a tragedy these words. It's very sad for me to even utter them. But this is the reality that most of the world is starting to believe as each generation passes by. As secularism increases in this world where man believes that he can exist apart from a creator, this is the belief that they're holding. And it's sad that even our young children and our young people, especially in the public schools, are believing more and more of this. There's no need for a God. I can do whatever I want. Like life is good. Eat, drink, for tomorrow we what? We die. And brothers and sisters, you might say, oh, no, I would never say that against God. Brothers and sisters, we've never doubted God's character in our own life. I must confess that many times I've asked the Lord to forgive me for the things that I have thought and uttered when I doubted his character and his love for me. How many times have we thought, Lord, if, well, if I was God, I wouldn't have created the devil in the first place or Lucifer, so this problem, we wouldn't be in this problem. Or if I was God, why doesn't he, I would have intervened. I wouldn't have allowed this to happen in my home. Or if I was God, I would have answered that prayer and healed that person that I was praying for. Have we ever doubted God's love for us? Have we ever told God, I can do it better than you? Same spirit, that old rebellion. Brothers and sisters, let's not be discouraged. Even the prophets of old, they saw God's mercy and love but they struggled in understanding the way that God works, the way he has to allow this great controversy to play out. We sometimes are saying, why didn't he come a thousand years ago and put an end to this? He already died. Why are we still here? Why is there still wars? Why is there still famines? Brothers and sisters, the prophets of old, Jeremiah said, righteous are thou, O Lord, when I plead with thee, yet let me talk with thee of the judgment. In other words, he understood that God is holy, he's righteous, but he said, can I please ask you some questions, God? He said, Wherefore doth the way of the wicked prosper? He said, I don't understand it. Why does it seem that evil people prosper? I try to do good. Our people are trying to return back to you, and yet the wicked seem to prosper. Wherefore are, are all they happy? Why are they happy that are dealing treacherously? Have you ever asked itself that question? Why is it that me, when I gave my life to God, I thought things would be better? And it seems I have more struggles now, more suffering, more trials, more temptations. Brothers and sisters, the struggle is real. This is a war. It's a battle that we're fighting. It's not being fought on the battlefields of Ukraine and Russia. The, the great controversy is being fought in the minds and heart of each and every one of us. Thou art pure. Habakkuk, he recognized that God is holy. Thou art pure than to behold evil and cannot not look on iniquity. Wherefore, I lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously and holdest thy tongue. He's saying, why, are you, why don't you speak up, Lord? Why don't you intervene? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Why doesn't God put an end to the war right now? Why doesn't God feed all these people that are starving and so around us? We've asked ourselves, even the prophets of old have asked, brothers and sisters, this is where the Bible has revealed enough. Not everything, because like I said, there are secrets that I'm not going to delve into because that is for God to know, but he has revealed enough. There's two principles that are mutually existing at the same time. You cannot separate them two. And one is that God is sovereign. Don't you say amen? Is he on the throne right now? Is he king of the universe? But there's also another principle in the universe that he's given every one of his creatures, and that is the principle of free will. One of the greatest gifts after the gift of life and salvation, the greatest gift that he could have given to man is the gift of free will. The fact that you can choose to love or not love your creator. But it came at a great risk. And that is the dilemma that we're seeing. Brothers and sisters, the great question that has plagued philosophers, theologians for hundreds if not thousands of years, why does suffering happen to everyone? Well, George, this morning I gave my life to God so many years ago, and why is there still suffering? Why do people still die? Why, do people, why is there still famines? I gave my life to God, and yet I still have troubles in my family. Brothers and sisters, we need to understand something. Evil and suffering does not come from God.
But if it doesn't come from God, where does it come from? And this is the part that, where faith comes in. There are four principles that the Word of God, based on the Word, we can understand where suffering comes from. First of all, for, uh, like I mentioned in the beginning of the message, sin is the ultimate su reason for suffering. In other words, everything that happens, the wars, the natural disasters, the famines, the plagues, the broken families, all of this can actually, the root cause of all this is sin. And what is sin? Sin is the manifestation of pride that leads us to separate from God. Disobedience. Number two, suffering also happens because it's the temporal consequences affect all of us, righteous, wicked, and even nature. Do you know that even nature is suffering because sin that was brought upon by man? Do you know the animals and plants are also suffering? They didn't make a choice to sin against God, and yet they're suffering the consequences. The brother Paul says that all creation moaneth and groaneth until the revelation of this, till waiting for the revelation of the sons of God so that Christ could come and put an end to this. Number three, man increases his suffering by his choices or the choice of others. This includes God's breaking his moral law, civil laws, and health and nature's laws. A lot of people might say, what are you talking about, George? Well, do you know that God has also instituted governments here on this earth to put a check to evil? And when we disobey even those civil laws, are there consequences to that? There are. Brothers and sisters, even health and nature's laws, God has his universe governed by laws. We can give an example like gravity, the laws of magnetism. How many of you guys have ever stubbed your toe or smashed it with a hammer? No one has done that? Man, that is the most painful thing when you're coming out at night and you're looking for something in the kitchen. You come out in the dark and you stub your toe against the door when you're going to the restroom in the middle of the night and it leaves your nail black that you're like, oh no, I'm going to lose it. I'm suffering. Who caused that? Is that God's fault? Is it Satan's fault? No. No, there was an action. And like the laws of physics say, for every action, there is a reaction, brothers and sisters. Now, you could have said, well, why didn't God send an angel and protect me and protect so my toe wouldn't, my toe wouldn't get stubbed and my nail? Brothers and sisters, God is not going to do for us that which he's already given us the ability. We need to remember, I've, I've even heard people within the church that say, I don't even wear a seatbelt because I know God is going to protect me. Really? Really? The presumption, brothers and sisters. God will not, if we're placing ourselves in a place of danger, disobeying not only the civil laws but the laws of physics, brothers and sisters, if you're driving faster than your angel could fly, what are we asking for, trouble? And if tragedy happens, who are we going to blame? Can we even blame Satan for that? Well, it seems like I'm trying to be cold-hearted, brothers and sisters, but what the reason is because I'm sick and tired of the devil misrepresenting God's character to his people. And it's happened to me where I've questioned, God, why didn't you do this, Lord? Why didn't you do that? Why didn't you answer that? I prayed for that person. That person still died. Number four, there is an enemy that is constantly trying to bring direct suffering, pain to God's children. We have the, the story of Job. Job didn't know what was happening behind the scenes. We do. This is, struggle is real. There's an enemy that hates you. After you give your life to Christ, you are now considered a traitor because before you were his legal captive. Christ bought you with an infinite price, and now you belong to him. And who loves a traitor? No one does. So in the eyes of Satan, you are a traitor, and he's doing everything to get you to join back into his ranks, to join back in his, this rebellion. Brothers and sisters, like I said, sin will touch everything, infect everything that it touches. But just a few months ago, I was at the ATM machine pulling out some money here at the Bank of America. I saw coming out of one of the tellers, a woman, she was, I could tell she was pregnant. She was smoking. And she was, I was wondering, and, I, and it's funny because now we're scared to tell anyone anything because I said if I say anything or someone else, she's probably going to tell me off. And, and I just saw her get into her vehicle, and I thought to myself, God forbid that that child is born with some kind of birth defect. And I said, who's to blame? Was, is God to blame if something happens? Brothers and sisters, let's think twice and very hard the next time that we willfully sin because not only does it break God's heart, but the effects... The consequences will infect everything around us. And even innocent people around us will be infected by our own sinful choices. 
Let's think about this. Brothers and sisters, God's character is like a coin. A coin has two sides. Heads and tails, still the same coin. Let's go to the Word of God this morning. I invite you to open up your Bibles to Exodus 33. Yes, I have it up there, but I wanted to share this with you so you can mark it in Bibles and, and read it for yourselves. So here's Moses. The Lord has done great miracles and signs. He's taken his people out of Egypt, and he's brought them to the foot of Mount Sinai. Brothers and sisters, what a privilege for Moses that he spoke to God as a friend, that he dared to ask God, not a presumption, but because he was so touched the, the manifestation of God's love in his life and of his people that he dared to ask this question. And maybe you've asked this question before. Look at what it says in Exodus 33, 18. And he said, please show me your what? Your glory. Then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face. For no man shall see my face and live. And the Lord said, Here is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. So it shall be, while my glory passes by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and will cover you with my hand while I will pass by. Who does the cleft of, what does the cleft of the rock represent? Jesus Christ. We can now go back to the Father because of him. He covers us. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back. So God was going to pass by in front of Moses in his form, but my face shall not be seen. Brothers and sisters, a mortal asking God, let me see your face. What a beautiful privilege that Moses had to dare to ask him. Sometimes we've asked God that. Lord, why don't you send an angel so I can believe? Why don't you do those great miracles from the past where you used to call fire from heaven, and then I'll know which way to go, brothers and sisters. Moses asked God, reveal yourself. I want to see your face. God doesn't show him his face but he does something greater, and he reveals his character. That when God says, I'm going to reveal my name, it means his character. What is God's character? He reveals himself. We don't have to be coming up with speculations about who God is. Let God reveal himself. Now the Lord descended in the cloud, so he's coming in a form. We don't know exactly what that is, but he came in a form and stood with him and proclaimed the name of the Lord. So he's proclaiming his own name, his own character. The Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions of, and sin, by no means clearing the guilty and visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. God does not punish children for the sins of the father, but we know that sin infects everything it touches and there are consequences to the choices that we make, brothers and sisters. Let us think twice, as I mentioned before. When I sin, I'm hurting my family, I'm hurting my church family, and I'm hurting the heart of God. Brothers and sisters, God is loving and merciful. Don't you say amen? Lamentations 3, and 23, they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Say unto them, as I live, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from the evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? We have others. He does not treat us as according as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. Does he, has he treated us according to what we deserve? Uh-uh. We would not be here if he treated us according to what we deserve. Brothers and sisters, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need repentance. Brothers and sisters, every time an individual, no matter what they have done, how far of a pit they've gone, when they repent and turn to God, there is a celebration in heaven. That means that God is not out to destroy people. Brothers and sisters, whatever the devil, that lie that he's trying to infect the world, what Richard Dawkins might say that that is the God of the Old Testament? No, brothers and sisters. Then the question is, okay, George, you say that he is a God of love, and sometimes we think that we know we're a little bit smarter than God, and we read the Bible and say, well, isn't the Bible full of contradictions, and what about this passage and this? Okay, let's study those really quick. Are you guys tired already? Can you guys give me a, four, a few more minutes? Are you guys already snoring with your eyes open? No? You guys tired of the Word of God? No? All right. 
Brothers and sisters, I've had these deep questions. I've had people in my college, when I was in college, they knew I was Christian, they would say, all right, George, what about this passage and this passage and this? You say that you serve a God that's loving and all loving and all powerful. Okay, you know what? I didn't have answers back then. I had to search myself for myself. I had to look in God's word. These are some of the top six. Okay, they say, okay, if God is so loving and he doesn't want to destroy, then what about instances like the flood? Number two, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Number three, the firstborn Egyptian sons slain during the first Passover. Number four, the slaughter of the Canaanites under the leadership of Moses and Joshua. Or what about the slaughter of the Amalekites, including women and children? Tough questions. Or what about the, the plagues, the seven last plagues in the future? You know, brothers and sisters, when people ask us these questions, we're not to ignore them. We're to point to people to the word of God. Let's not. We need to study this for ourselves. Let's understand something, brothers and sisters, in all of these instances, difficult instances. Remember, God is in a dilemma. How does he deal with sin while at the same time dealing with the sinner? Brothers and sisters, the book of Hebrews says that God is a consuming fire for sin. He is holy. Don't you say amen? Is he holy? He is holy. Is he all loving? Yes, he is, but he's also all holy. Is he mercy? Is he merciful? But he's also justice? You cannot have it both ways, brothers and sisters. If God would only be all mercy, then he would be an unjust God. And if he was only justice or just just, then he wouldn't all be merciful at the same time. You cannot have it both ways. His love is a combination of two things equally existing at the same time, mercy and justice. No one said amen. But listen to this principle. We, we have instances, destruction of Jerusalem, the flood, Ananias and Sapphira, when they immediately they sinned against the Holy Spirit. It might seem that God says, wow, he's such a vindictive God, arbitrary, he just killed him. Brothers and sisters, if the unrepentant sinner refuses to separate from sin, what ends up happening is that the sinner will then become identified with the sin. So here's God. He wants to forgive you. He wants to cleanse you from all sin and righteousness. Is there any sin that he, can't forgi- that he cannot forgive? There's only one, and that is the refusal to... F- uh, there's only one, it's the sin that you don't want to let go of. That ends up becoming blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit is touching your heart constantly, and he's speaking to you, and he's saying, I'm calling you, I've loved you with an everlasting love, I'm calling you. And you say, no, I've seen your truth, I've seen your love and mercy, but I still want to follow my own way. What more is there for God to do for that person? You become identified for the very sin that you're committing. And so you grieve the Holy Spirit, and those are the instances. Brothers and sisters, God doesn't want to destroy anyone. Man ends up destroying himself by his own election. That is difficult for us to understand. You know, a lot of times they tell me, well, what about those Canaanites? Why did God destroy poor men and women and children? Brothers and sisters, God's sovereignty, he's such an amazing God that he could be be like a dictator. It's my way or the highway. Do you know that God's sovereign will even works in context of your free will? Man's free will many times even limits God's sovereign will in your life. He has great promises for you and your family, for this church, great promises and revelations and plans, but it's man's free will that many times puts limitations on God's sovereign will in your life. Look at this in Exodus. When the people of Israel came out of Egypt, God didn't desire them to take up the sword against the Canaanites. He had a plan A. It was a perfect one. When the Canaanites heard of the great marvels that God had done in Egypt, it was the, the Canaanites had two choices. Either they were going to run in fear and abandon the land, or they would then repent and become and join Israel, as some of those peoples did join Israel. Don't, don't you remember Uriah the Hittite, one of David's bodyguards? He was a Hittite, but he joined God's people for those because the great grace was given to all. Listen carefully. I will send my fear to you. I will cause confusion among the people with, uh, to whom you come. I will make of all your enemies turn their backs to you, and I will send hornets. So God was going to use the fear of 
all those marvels that he had done in Egypt and also even the forces of nature to fight for the people. God didn't desire that the people, they were not warriors. They came out of Egypt. They were slaves. They didn't have weapons. And the Hittite from before you, but brothers and sisters, God's people, they claim to be God's people, but they always were in a constant state of disobedience. Can that be our constant state where we're limiting God's promises? So what did God have to do? Well, then he had to go to a plan B, and so they ended up joining even the practices of the Canaanites. So God, in his mercy and his justice, had to then use Israel themselves as his instrument of justice. You know, brothers and sisters, when we talk about these, these Canaanites, we're like, God, why did he destroy them? You know he had given them over 400 years to repent since the time of Abraham? In the fourth generation from your descendants, we'll come back here. For the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. God would have spared all those peoples in Canaan if they would have repented and they would have joined Israel. That was God's plan A. You know, then I talk when I have people, what about the kids? Well, they were innocent. You know, brothers and sisters, I've already spoken that sin is like a cancer. It infects everything that it touches. I had a, a, a friend years ago back in college. He actually was a sniper for the U.S. Marines. Um, he fought in the, this war in Afghanistan after the 9-11 when the war was declared, I believe, in Afghanistan in 2003. And he still has traumas over the things that he had to do. And one time he spoke to me um, and he said, you know, George, you think God can forgive me for some of the things that I did? And I said, well, like, what happened over there? And he's like, well, I was, I'm a, I was a sniper back then. And he said that the time came for me to make tough decisions in battle where I had to snipe and take out women and children. And I said, why? And he says, well, unfortunately, what these terrorists do, even with kids, they teach them that in their philosophy, this terrorism that they have is that it's a great honor for them to die as martyrs for this cause. And so he said that they, when they would be in villages, he would have to be on these high places as a sniper watching who was coming in and out of the village, especially in these busy marketplaces. And they, women and children would be strapped with dynamite and explosives to take out as many people. He had no choice but to save the hundreds, if not thousands, in these places. He had to snipe out these people before they even entered the village. Brothers and sisters, this is the dilemma that our sin is putting on God. This is the dilemma that we sometimes bring upon our own families and our own lives. A serious dilemma. It's a sin infects everything that it touches. But brothers and sisters, praise God, we cannot know how much we owe Christ for the peace and protection that we enjoy. I say amen. It is the restraining power of God that presents man, prevents mankind from passing fully under the control of Satan. The disobedient and unthankful have a great reason for gratitude for God's mercy and long-suffering and holding in check the cruel, malignant power of the evil one. But when men pass the limits of divine forbearance, that restraint is removed. Praise God, like Luke says, is he causes the sun to, rain, uh, to fall on the evil and the good, the, the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. Amazing God's love. Brothers and sisters, yes, there are seven last plagues that will come at some time in the near future, but even these plagues will be an act of love. Don't you say amen? amen. We cannot complain against God, brothers and sisters. When we believe that God is love, we cannot, no matter what doubts Satan or the world throws at us, God is love, and that's an unmovable principle in our lives. God is love. You know, there are coming these plagues. There will come. But you know what? Even for God, this is what Isaiah calls, Isaiah, I believe, 28 says that it is a strange work for God to destroy. You know that it goes against God's nature to destroy the very thing that he's created? It's strange for him. It goes against his very thing. He is life. In him was life but he also has to respect the free will of his creatures. Even the destruction of the wicked and the earth will be an act of love. When God does this, he will take no pleasure and delight. When he allows this unrepentant sinner to suffer the consequence, the eternal consequence of their choice, he will weep when he has to do this. This is a strange work. This is the dilemma. 
God does not stand toward the sinners of execution of the sentence against transgression, but he leaves the rejectors of his mercy to themselves to reap that which they have sown. Every ray of light rejected, every warning despised or unheeded, every passion indulged, every transgression of the law is a seed sown which yields its unfailing harvest. The Spirit of God persistently resisted as at last withdrawn for the sinner. In the time of Noah, 120 years, the Holy Spirit pleaded with the people, and there is left no power to control the evil passions of the soul and no protection from the malice and enmity of Satan. The destiny of the wicked is fixed by their own choice. Their exclusion from heaven is voluntarily with themselves and just and merciful on the part of heaven. What if God, what if there really was universalism where God says, okay, you did whatever you wanted, and, and I'll come back in the pearly gates. What would happen? Wouldn't this whole great controversy start all over again in heaven? Would he allow sin to infect heaven again? Brothers and sisters, the dilemma, what does God do with his children? He loves them all, but there are rebellious children that had willingly joined in this rebellion, and if they had the opportunity, would even kick God off his throne. What does he do to protect you know, there's a time coming, brothers and sisters, very soon that even Satan himself will have to kneel before Christ. And he will have to recognize true and just as your ways, O Lord. Even Satan will have to recognize that God did everything to save him. Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and your name? For you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifest. That the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and those in heaven and those on earth, and of those under earth, and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of the Father of heaven. Brothers and sisters, what does this mean for us? Thank, thank you, George, for sharing this. It was really nice. Not, no, 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 no. This is where we put the word of God into practice. How do we show God that we've truly understood his character and his love for us? It's the way that we treat each other. Brothers and sisters, if you say you love the person sitting next to you, then there are two aspects, mercy and justice. How do we show mercy and justice in this world? Justice we show when we stand up for what is right. When you're the only one in the crowd, like in the picture, where you see everyone going the wrong way towards destruction, and you stand up at your job, stand up at your school, and say, you know what? This is not right. We need to stand up for truth. That is justice. Don't you say amen? In a world that needs it. On the other side, love. We need to have mercy towards others as well. Hasn't God been merciful to us? You know, many times when people, when we sin against others, we want mercy. But when they sin against us, we want justice. It cannot be that way, brothers and sisters. We even quote scriptures when we want justice. We even tell God, yeah, God, but you said vengeance is mine. I will repay. Okay, can you please do justice for me? And if you need me as an instrument of justice, hey, I'm available. Brothers and sisters, we need to also, the way we show that we have understood God's character is the way that we demonstrate mercy and justice in this world. So his purpose for people today is the same that it was for Israel when he brought them forth from Egypt. By beholding the goodness, the mercy and justice, and the love of God revealed in his church, the world is to have a representation of his character. And when the law of God is thus exemplified in the life, even the world will recognize the superiority of those who love and fear and serve God above every other people in the world. It's this, this is the season right now that we can represent God. There's a, by tradition, much of the world is thinking about the first coming. This is a perfect opportunity as a church to reveal. I'd like to close this morning. I'm sorry that I went a little past time. But I had heard that the brothers and sisters at Moreno Valley are not like other churches. I heard that when the word of God opens, they forget that they're hungry. They forget that they're tired. And they only have, they only have hunger for, for righteousness. But I don't know if that's true. We'll see. I close with this beautiful illustration. I'd like to introduce you to Dashrash Manji. He passed away a few years ago, 2007. You know what happened to Dashrath Manji? There's also a documentary made. He, a man grew up in India during the 1950s and 60s. In the year 1959, his wife tragically died due to an accident by the mountainside. I believe it was an injury that she fell. Unfortunately, great poverty in that area of India. The nearest hospital or any type of medical facility was 95 kilometers away. Brothers and sisters, he was not able to get his wife on time to receive the medical services, and she passed away due to the injuries. You know, 
Jothras Manji's passed through a period of depression just like all of us can pass through. Suffering, separation, a tragedy, financial crisis, falling into sin, brothers and sisters. But you know what Dashrath Manji decided to do? He decided to turn that depression, that sadness of what that great tragedy into doing something for his own people. And you know what he decided? He said, you know what? I never want anyone from my village to ever have to die or suffer because of a tragedy, because of injury or illness. I'm going to make a way. There was a huge mountain that blocked the villagers had to, by bicycle or by horse, had to go around this whole mountain range to even get to the other nearest town. Look at what he decided to do by himself. People mocked him and laughed. He decided to carve a path of 110 meters long, 91, uh, 9.1 meters wide, and 7.7 .7 meters deep through a ridge of hills using only a hammer and a chisel. For 22 years, he worked with a hammer and a chisel. People laughed at him, you're crazy. And he said, Dashwa shortened the travel between the Atri and the Wazanji, which were villages, blocks of Gaia, district, and he shortened it from, only, from 55 kilometers to only 15. After his life, finally the Indian government got into this after he died, and as today, they finally cut through the mountain and they finally built a road in honor of his name. Brothers and sisters, we doubt of God's love didn't he, look at, we, thought, we talk about, what about he is coming, his first coming? He came as a child to suffer and die. He came, sometimes you think, God doesn't understand me. He doesn't understand that I'm poor, I'm suffering through. Really? Really? Wasn't Christ poor the rest of, he said that the foxes have holes and they have dens to sleep. The son of man doesn't even have a pillow to lay his head. So God understands us in our, in our financial crisis. What about the example that he gave us at his baptism? He wasn't a sinner, and yet he came to give us the example to lead us back to the Father. What about his betrayal? You've ever said, the Lord doesn't understand me because he doesn't know what betrayal feels like. I've been betrayed by family, by friends, maybe by even church members. Brothers and sisters, was Christ betrayed for you and me? Brothers and sisters, you might say, well, he doesn't understand me. He doesn't know the power of addiction or temptation. Didn't he go through the hardest three temptations that any man can go undergo? Brothers and sisters, the Bible tells us here is where justice and mercy come together. And they come in together in the person of Christ. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed one another. The same way as the illustration of this character in India made a way for his people, Christ made a way back to the Father. He didn't want anyone to die for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whomsoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Brothers and sisters, as we remember during this season his first coming, let us remember and never doubt of his love for you and for me. When trials come, yes, temptations will come, tragedies that we don't have maybe all the answers to, but let us stand on that firm, eternal truth that in everything that God allows and even what he permits, it's because he loves you and me. May God bless the hearing and reading of his word this morning.